All right. So we're gonna we're gonna switch gears a little bit today, and uh, um, we'll talk about when you come to our clinics. And so, I, as Dr. Ringberg just said, I work at the Johns Hopkins Transverse Myelitis Center, where we help diagnose transverse myelitis. We help uh, with some of the management of the symptoms uh, that that you have. But then, what can we do to actually help you improve function again? When I went to medical school, we were taught that the uh, that the nervous system is static, and that sort of dates me maybe a little bit, um, that there was no, no repair that, that can happen. I was taught, you know, we, the nervous system has some uh, mechanisms to reroute some, some connections, but couldn't repair, and that turns out not to be true. And so what, we, what we're doing, especially at the International Neurorehabilitation Rehabilitation Institute, we're focusing on interventions and helping you get better. Uh, but before we can do that, we have to talk about a couple um, sort of uh, important concepts so that we can actually, you can uh, understand better um, why are we doing what we're doing. All right, so the first important concept is that when we talk about transverse myelitis, or maybe later on, maybe only refer to it as myelitis, um, it, it affects the spinal cord. And in the spinal cord, it causes an injury. So we can, if we want to simplify this, this is a spinal cord injury. It's just not from trauma, like from falling. This is an injury from um, most likely inflammation happening. And uh, the symptoms, Dr. Levy just pointed it out very nicely in transverse myelitis, and most people who are um, affected by it know it. You know, you have weakness, you have numbness, you have uh, difficulty with bowel and bladder dysfunction. Um, pain is a, is a common presentation. Um, muscle stiffness, very common, and one of the biggest obstacles in many people with uh, affected by myelitis. And when we look at the spinal cord itself, and so this is a, uh, a picture of, not of human, this is a picture of a rat who had a, had, who had a spinal cord. Because it's really hard to do those things in people, uh, to cut up the spinal cord and look at it, what happens. <laughs> we try not to do that. <laughs> so, so if you look at the slide, um, we, if we assume you had a, an injury, like an inflammation to your spinal cord in the middle of your, of your spine, so let's say at the thoracic level nine, which is a little bit above your umbilicus. And, um, and you think that all the injury that happens there only affects that level or maybe something below. That's sort of the concept that you would think, but it's not true. So if you look in the spinal cord, and this is kind of where it's depicted here, in the, in the center, this is the injury between around T9, T10. This is C2, C2 stands for cervical two. That means it's a, it's a cut of the spinal cord really high up, right after it, uh, below your skull. Um, and you see everything that's white in these, in, these, in these slices are areas where there's inflammation happening in the cord, following a single trauma to the middle of the spinal cord. And you see this in here that the, the spinal cord is, this thing is, not working, is affected all the way up till here in the cervical two, then you go lower to thoracic one, which is a, which is a, little, bit, a little bit about here, then thoracic seven, this is closer to the lesion, you see all the white spots, this is where all the inflammation is happening, and then we go away from it, we go at the lesion site and below, and shows you that lumbar, <clears throat> lumbar one and lumbar five are all affected. So that means even though you have a single injury to a very specific site in the cord, the whole spinal cord is affected for a long time afterwards. So that sometimes helps us to kind of explain why you have sometimes symptoms that may not be completely related to the site where your doctor told you your TM had affected you and uh, makes it even more important when we talk about the concept of rehabilitation because we're not only trying to affect a single level of the spinal cord, we're trying to affect the whole spinal cord. Does it make sense? All right. So the second, the second concept is, you know, how much repair do we need to do? So this is, you have seen a couple MRIs today, and so maybe by the end of the day, you're all experts in reading MRIs. So this is another slice. So if you look at me like from the side like this, we slice me th through the center, and it's at the level of the neck where you see these little square-shaped guys here. These are the bones in your spinal column. And you see the black stripes in between. These are your discs. Then you see this structure up here, and if you sort of follow this out all the way to the ceiling, the pointer is not working very well, um, this, is your, this is your brain. And from the brain, it funnels down this little black stripe here. Do you see this black stripe? That's your spinal cord. And that's the one we're mostly focusing on when we talk about myelitis. And you see in the spinal cord, it should be sort of dark grayish, like you see here and like you see it down here. That's normal. We're looking for boring gray in the spinal cord. And as soon as it doesn't look boring gray, and we see sort of white stripes, white spots, uh, yeah, like you see it right here, that's abnormal. 
And so that's usually an area in the spinal cord that's, that's affected by, uh, uh, by the myelitis. And so you see how big this thing is. So if you look in the, the diameter of the spinal cord, uh, you see it sitting right there and it almost fills up the whole cord. And you would think that all the signals that come from the brain going down the spinal cord have to pa get past this side and go down. And you know that all the signals, if they want to get to the brain, like your sensation, they come from down here, like moving up the spinal cord, have to get past this side and make it to the brain. And you would think, based on the size of this thing, that there is a lot, that there's very little information coming through. Turns out that the MRI itself doesn't help us predict function. So you can have a really large lesion like this sitting there and be very functional. Maybe you come to my clinic and you, know, you, may, you may have some numbness in your hands or maybe some balance difficulty and maybe some bowel and bladder difficulty, but overall you might be okay. And then we have people that come to my clinic with much, much smaller lesions on the MRI who are completely paralyzed. So the MRI doesn't help us in terms of predicting the function, but it also tells us that uh, we do not need to repair the whole spinal cord. Everybody always thinks, you know, we have a lesion and we have to fix this whole system. We don't need to. Um, if anybody ever heard me speak about this, um, and I get a little bit passionate about this, what do we, do we need a brain to walk? No, no right, so why? Because the program for walking is actually in the spinal cord. So the program for walking is sitting lower down in the spinal cord, and it's, it has a fancy name, it's called the central pattern generator. And so we can actually walk without our brain. And um, you know, uh, people who may have grown up on a farm and may have uh, worked with chicken and may have seen sometimes they, they lose their head, and they can, they, they can run and they can fly, right, until they run out of oxygen. And um, there's actually a much crueler story in, in the European literature, which I'm not gonna say today. <laughs> You can ask me later about it. Um, but uh, all that the brain does, it turns a little subcomputer, a little subroutine, uh, turns it on and off. So it says, start walking, stop walking, and it modulates the program. It says, go faster, go slower. So all the information that has to get past this side here is this little of, of, of guidance that, that tells, you know, use, use that, that subcomputer. So full repair is not needed in the spinal cord. And so when we, when we talk about repair, we talk about regeneration. And uh, what are the cells that, um, that comprise the whole nervous system that we are trying to fix? So at first, the, the thing that Dr. Levy already pointed out and Dr. Greenberg earlier, you know, we have those cables that start in, the, in our brain and send a really long arm down to, to the spinal cord, or you said it called the wire one. Um, and these are, those cables are made by neurons. And, and they look like, if you look on the microscope, uh, they look just like that. This is a beautiful cell culture of, of a neuron in, in culture. And then those neurons reach out with a long arm. And of them, there are millions of them sort of packed down the spinal cord. And in order to do that, it's like in, in, in your house when you run a, a telephone wire from your uh, third floor to your basement, although I think nobody does it anymore, right? <laughs> it's, it's all wireless now, but when we used to. Um, so. You, <laughs> So you have to uh, run these wires, and you make sure that each one of these wires is actually insulated, right? Because if they lose the insulation, you either make no phone call, or you know, it's, it's, it's scrambled. You, know, you can barely hear the person on the other side. The same thing in the nervous system. All these wires, as they come from your brain, go down your spinal cord, have to be insulated. If they're not insulated, um, they don't work very well. And the cell that does the insulation is a really long name. It's down here. It's called the oligodendrocyte. And it looks like a little star. And that, that single oligodendrocyte has the, the, uh, the ability to reach out to more than one of those wires to hold it and insulate it. Actually, they, they insulate about 40 to 60 of those wires. So they're extremely important. And then the other cells that sort of support them all are called astrocytes, and they look, they look in culture just like that. And uh, when, we, when we talk about repair of the nervous system, and I said you know, we didn't think that this existed, and I'm trying to convince you today that this is not true, uh, we, we also have to figure out that our nervous system itself has a very large pool of, re of repair cells sitting there. I have many times patients come into our clinic saying, you know, I heard about stem cells. I want to go to Spain. I want to go to Israel. I want to go to Russia to get these stem cells because I think I heard this is going to help me. And I'm trying to tell everybody, actually, you do have stem cells. And these stem cells are actually able to do their job. 
we can take these cells out of the spinal cord, and again, we don't do this in people, um, and we put them in an additional lab, and these cells build any nervous system tissue that we want them to, so they work very well. We stick them back in the spinal cord, they don't do that. We can, we can take these cells out and stick them in certain areas in the brain where we know that they, they can build, they make neurons, and they do. And you take them from there and stick them back in the spinal cord, they don't do that. So what does it tell us is that actually there's nothing wrong with these stem cells. You know, you have these cells there, they're capable of doing everything. There's just something wrong with the environment we're placing them into. And so it took us a long time, and I'm going to sort of distill this for you in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, what signals do these cells need to do their job? And if I want to show you how they look like in the spinal cord, this is how they look like. Not quite as pretty as in culture. You know, these are the cells. The red part is the, the nucleus, kind of the center of the cell. And the green part is the cell body. And there are the stem cells coming in different sort of differentiation, differentiation levels, meaning how young versus how old they are. Like they can be called tripotential progenitors. That means they can still become anything, like neurons, oligos, astrocytes. And then they sort of start differentiating and then all the way down to like, uh, like adult astrocytes and adult oligodendrocytes. And all these cells are generated in the spinal cord at all times every day while we're sitting here. So we're all doing this right now. Uh, with TM, without TM, we all do that. Um, where do they, how do they look like? If you look for sort of the bird's eye view on the, on the spinal cord, you see this little butterfly structure that you've seen a couple times today. Everywhere that one of these arrows is, this is where we have seen those cells. So they're pretty much born all around the spinal cord. And if you zoom in very closely, you see this is how they look like, like these little dots. So not, not very exciting, but uh, they have a lot of power. And uh, so when, we, when we're trying to figure out you know, what is wrong with the, with the environment in the spinal cord that, pre that prevents them from doing their job, it turns, it turns out that if the connections that they're supposed to fix are not actively firing, they cannot see them to repair them. And where does it come from is our nervous system, even when we are, before we are born, needs a lot of electrical guidance or activity to do its job appropriately. So in order to find the right targets, in order to make the right connections, it has to be active. If the, if the system is not active, it doesn't work very well. And in, in the setting of an injury, so when we said, you know, we, let's, let's put an injury like in the middle of your spinal cord, what happens to the areas below that are not connected directly to the brain anymore is that activity goes down. So considering that we need activity to actually maintain the system and repair the system, and now you have an injury, you're not only not providing enough activity, but it actually goes down. That seems to be one of the main, um, main problems why repair is so slow or incomplete in uh, in, in transverse myelitis. And the, the easiest thing that we can do from a rehabilitation approach is being as active as possible in terms of, of, of exercise. So we know that we all should exercise with or without TM, right? <laughs> I try. Um, the, uh, so the main, the main benefits from that is generally, you know, you have improved fit, even fatigue, uh, spasticity, like the muscle stiffness gets, gets better. People improve their strength, improve their endurance. Uh, we can even see uh, improvements in, in, in bowel and bladder function over time. But most importantly, why are we doing exercises? When I said we want to stimulate those endogenous stem cells, the ones that you have to do their job, this is what you do by that. So you kind of increase activity and help them do their job. And, um, and so how, but how can we make this even more eff uh, efficacious? So we know the exercise itself is good, and we, we advocate for it with everybody. But um, there's a concept in rehabilitation called activity-based rehabilitation, meaning we're trying to potentiate the effects of exercise, and with that, potentiate the effect on the, on the stem cells in order to help to do their repair job. And if we look at this in a much more schematic way, so if, I, if I'm going to explain to you the neuron, which is the wire of the nervous system, which is this little structure here in, in gray. And then we have the insulation of the nervous system, which is in, in yellow. And what was the cell type called? The oligo, right, excellent. Um, so the oligo is in, in, in between, sort of reaches out and makes the insulation. And I said, you know, one oligo can reach out to like 40 to 60 wires. And uh, so if, in the case of, 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 of transverse myelitis, where there's largely an, um, an effect 
on the insulation. So you, let's say you remove a couple of these oligodendrocytes. And so what happens if they're gone, suddenly you have bare naked wires, right? You see this here. In, in the nervous system, the wire is really long. Now wire one coming from the brain going to the spinal cord and wire two coming from the spinal cord going out. So you see how long this is and how tiny it is. If there's just a tiny bit of insulation missing, this whole wire doesn't work. So, so you lose a lot, of a lot of information travel from the brain to the spinal cord just by losing a little bit of insulation on one spot. So if you do that, and here you can kind of see that these things are now inactive. So what has to happen in terms of repair, you also see the little red dots here in between. These are the stem cells. So they're just sitting there all the time and waiting to, waiting to, be, to be needed. And uh, so what they have to do first, they have to figure out you know, where are they needed. You know, they have to get called into this room. So somebody in here, let's say the injury happened in this room, somebody has to call these cells. And they're actually very smart enough to actually do that. They move in, they have to come into this room, and then set up shop. You see they're red when they're, still, when they're still stem cells. They move in, and then again change color. So they have to become actually an oligodendrocyte. And that's still not enough. Now they, still, now they have to find out which one of these wires do they have to insulate. And when they do that, this is what should happen. That's what we want them to do. The problem is they don't. So the problem, what, what still happens is these, these stem cells are smart enough to figure out that there's a problem. So they're actually able to move in, and then they just sit there like, like bumps on a lock. You know, they just, you know, we got all called into this room, and uh, there's no speaker here, you know? <laughs> so we don't know what to do. But so, it's a, you know, it took a long time, and I said, what can we do to help uh, increase activity in these cables here? So what, we have to increase activity in these cables, and I make, depict this with little pluses, and that's, the effect of exercise, and especially the effect of exercise combined with electrical stimulation. Have anybody ever heard about uh, functional electrical stimulation? I see some nods here. Who hasn't? A couple of people over there. Okay, so functional electrical stimulation is, um, comes in all kinds of different shapes and sizes. So from little tiny boxes to, that cost you know, 100, 150 bucks, to like large equipment that costs up to, up to 30 to 40 thousand dollars. But what it does, you can actually apply electricity to weak muscle groups. And uh, by that, induce a, a contracture of, of that muscle, and, and, and uh, with that, you can actually, uh, create function. Uh, this, this therapy or this concept came out a long time before I even was born. So, <laughs> uh, so in the 1950s and 60s, people had uh, used this, this kind of technology in, in powerlifting. I don't know if everybody's seen people who did, you know, you do powerlifting to like full exertion. And then when you can't, just can't get anymore, then you have the electrodes on your triceps and you zap them and so you get, I can, you can get some more. So this is where the concept came from. And at that time it was very crude. When, it, when I talked to patients who used that technology in the, in, the, in the 70s, they said it was like putting your finger in a light socket. So, but that's not by, by far not that, that anymore. So we have now uh, lots of groups of therapists uh, in, in, in the country, and Dr. Martin is out here with her team, um, who has been uh, teaching people with that um, for years now on, on what's called activity-based rehabilitation, kind of teach your physical therapist, teach your occupational therapist um, to use that type of equipment and explain to everybody you know, why this is being used, um, figure out you know, what are the right exercises, uh, teach you as a patient to use it, or teach you as a caregiver to use it on your loved one, because these therapies take a long time. So this is something that's not you coming to, a, to our group center and then we're gonna say we see you for two weeks or and send you home, say goodbye, <laughs> uh, call us if you have problems. This is an intervention, this repair is a lifelong repair. It never stops. So if you had TM uh, last week, you know, we start to this really early, but if you had TM 20 years ago, we still do that because the nervous system's repair capacity uh, continues throughout life. It might be slower as you, as you age, but overall it never stops. Repair generally stops when you start rehabbing. And so if you can uh, activate these, these connections here, sort of light up the connections by using exercise in combination with electrical stimulation, you light those up, now these cells, as you, as you can see, they started turning into oligos and now since they know, because they can see those connections here, they can reach out and actually uh, recreate those wires. That's the way how we think that uh, 
activity-based rehabilitation helps. Um, that the Greenberg was trying to uh, have me point out a little bit when he said there's a difference if you have a, a problem with wire one versus wire two uh, in rehabilitation. And I'm trying to sort of soften this just a little bit um, because the, the concepts of activity-based rehabilitation, meaning by increasing activity in your spinal cord, um, at the same time in increasing regeneration, apply to both types of injuries. When it becomes important, the difference between the wire one and wire two injury is how your therapist approach you in terms of the, the equipment we use from, uh, from the electrostimulation equipment and uh, how, a, what equipment to use and how we sort of set the parameters on that. But overall, even though uh, some people with those called wire two injuries or lower motor neuron injuries may not necessarily have a contraction in response to the electrostimulation, still get the benefits from it. So we, in, in, at our center, we, we have a couple of clinical trials running uh, where we're measuring the markers of repair in the spinal fluid in response to, to electrical stimulation. And it turns out, even though if you have one of those lower motor, lower motor neuron type injuries or wire two injuries, and you don't get responses in, in terms of contractions, you still get all the changes that are needed to help with the repair. And so if we, if you look at this as, as a graph here, and we're plotting uh, regeneration, so meaning we want to have in the high, as high level as possible of regeneration in the spinal cord and activity. We know that with, with regular exercise, if we just use exercise, we know that the more, the more active you are, the more regeneration you're going to get, and then probably at some point it may be an optimal level, and then it falls off again. If you, com if you combine so if, if, you, if you look at the graph itself, you see that TM, like after an, 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 an episode of TM, you're sort of down here at this level. What you're trying to do, you're trying to push yourself up that curve because you, know, you, you want to have repair as much as possible. But if you combine exercise with uh, FES, with electrical stimulation, you're going to get a curve just like that. So you, you potentiate your, uh, your rehabilitation potential. And... Um, then the common question I get to this graph is, so you show me that the more activity I do, the better I'm gonna be at. But at some point, it's too much. And I guarantee there's a couple of people in this room who have been told, you know, A, you don't overexercise, or B, um, you know, don't do too much, because if you do too much, you're gonna cause damage. And that you would think with this, with this group that would exist. In practicality, it doesn't exist. So we have used uh, the combination of exercise with electrical stimulation, and first in people. We always do everything backwards now in this. We did it in people first, and we were able to see the more people did, the better they were off. And the, sort of the threshold only becomes how much time can you actually spend at home? Um, because you know when people, uh, I have you know one or two people in my clinic that actually exercise seven days a week for years, uh, but they always I always tell them you know you make everybody else look bad, <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> so that's that's not that's not a, that's not a common thing, um, but uh, we but we couldn't reach the upper level. So we knew these people who did more did better. Uh, then we said, well, well, let's take it into animals. Maybe animals we can sort of stimulate them as much as we can, and maybe we find that upper threshold until they start getting worse again when we do things. And uh, so we did this with all the animal guidelines that we have to follow in, 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 at the university setting. So you can't be cruel to animals, but we were also unable to find the upper threshold. We knew the more we used activity and with exercise and electrical stimulation, the more there was cell proliferation at the, at the spinal cord level and the more repair was happening. Well, then we thought, well, maybe if we can't do it in, in people, we can't do it in animals, let's do it in cells. You know, we just put them in a cell culture and just stimulate them 24 seven. And the same thing happened we could not find that upper threshold. I still think it probably is there, but in practicality, not an issue. So that's why I tell my, my patients in clinic, say, if you can tolerate it, do it. And sometimes when we, I don't want everybody to run out this evening and say, hey, Dr. Beck said I should go exercise, you know, as much as, as possible. You have to slowly escalate that. Because if you do this right now and just go out and start pushing the highest weights ever, you're gonna be down and out for the next couple of days. Uh, because your body needs some time to adjust for these types of programs. But this is where it becomes important to have a good rehabilitation team on hand. People who show you the exercises, make sure it's safe, make sure it's uh, tailored just to your function, because there's no one rehab program the same for, for everybody here. So um, 
So partner very closely with the, with the rehab folks, force the issue of electrical stimulation. I know Sam is walking over, so I'll, I'll hurry up. Um, <laughs> so how does, it, how does it in general look like when we do these, these programs? Um, because as, as I said, this is not a one-time deal. So what you want to do, you, we, we, we set up an initial uh, evaluation with the physician. We set up in, at the same time, around the same time, a, an evaluation with the, with the therapist. Once the therapist has seen you, then we, we develop, a, we put our heads together and say, okay, what's the plan of action for this patient? And so we design a program that you, you come to the center, we build this program for you, figuring out what's the right equipment, teach you how to use it, and then we send you home with it. Because the, most of this work happens at home, um, especially since insurances don't cover you in, in therapy for 365 days a year. And, and my big goal always is when I have you in rehab is I actually want to make your life easier. I don't want the rehab to take over. And that's not the goal. The rehab should be sort of a supplement to help you achieve what you want to do. And if we, if you catch me afterwards, we can tell you what other fun things in rehab you can do. Um, the, so then you go home for a couple months. You follow this as an in-home rehabilitation program. And then we bring you back, usually for a little bit shorter periods of time, update this program to your newest level, and send you back home. And, and at each one of those visits, and so on, we're just going to keep going. And at each one of those visits, we're going to make sure that you have a physician uh, evaluation to make sure we look at all the other uh, problems that are associated with the myelitis. You know, we call it bowel, bladder, sexual function, spasticity, pain, all these things are being put in there. And uh, I think I made it. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'd be happy to answer questions. <laughs> yes, <sir. laughs>